We're on a mission from God. Wendy? Stay So I got that going. Darling? Looks like I picked the wrong week to quit sniffing blue. Light of my life. We enjoy your films. I am a human being. I thought they smelled bad on the outside. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in real time, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today marks the 40th anniversary of the release of Borderline on October 31st, 1980. It was written by Gerald Friedman and Stephen Klein, directed by Friedman, and released by Associated Film Distribution. Screenwriter Stephen Klein gathered his research for the film as a journalist covering the U.S. Border Patrol's difficulty controlling an influx of illegal immigration. He observed their protocol and procedures in person, and an agent he befriended in the process, Albert Ab Taylor, served as a technical advisor on the film and a loose inspiration for the character of Jeb Maynard, played in this film by Johnny Bronson. The film was shot on real Southern California slash Mexico borders, The film was originally developed by Michael Douglas for Columbia Pictures, with Gene Hackman set to star in the Jeb role. Hmm. I could see that. Just before production was to begin, Hackman retired for the (laughs) first of several times over the course (laughs) of his career. Uh, When Hackman was replaced with Bronson, Douglas dropped out of the project, not wanting to produce a Charlie Bronson movie. (laughs) (laughs) This film became the second in a three-film contract between Lord Lou Grade's ITC Films and Charlie Bronson, having been preceded by Love and Bullets in 79 and followed by The Evil That Men Do in 1984. We start with a title that reads Lord Grade Presents, which I think we last saw on Raise the Titanic. Mm. Um, He's done a couple movies so far this year. Uh, During the opening credits, uh, it says that it's starring A. Wilford Brimley, one of the many Wilford Brimleys of the 1980s. A. Wilford Brimley. (laughs) Never your Wilfred Brimley. <laughs> DP Tak Fujimoto gets a credit. I think we last saw his work for Where the Buffalo Roam, mm-hmm. but he also worked on the other Art Linson film, Melvin and Howard. Right. So. And the first episode of MacGyver. That's right. With some other people in this. A title reads U.S. Mexican Border, 20 miles east of San Diego, California, December 1979. This movie makes a huge point out of always telling. Every time yeah. where you are. Yeah. And it never, to- <laughs> yeah, it never matters. <laughs> I think they were just worried because they were shooting on a lot of back roads at night. And so they wanted you to be able to like at least think about a map in your head. I it, But it, I don't care. Yeah, I like throughout either. the rest of the film, I mean, these titles show up a lot of times. And I never care. It, as yeah. long as I know we're relatively close to the border, I'm yeah. fine. <laughs> and the movie stays there. So you yeah. know that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and. It's, it, it, sometimes it's down to like yards. Yeah, right. Like it, it's like it's like works with miles, but then one time it says eight hundred yards. It's like okay, come on. So it's so very important. Eight eight football fields. <laughs> um, I also don't like that they uh, capitalize the word east. Uh, they capitalize the cardinal directions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which traditionally you don't capitalize them. I do traditionally, but <laughs> you don't. We slowly pan across a barbed wire fence early in the morning. Suddenly, a coyote, and by coyote, I mean a human leading immigrants across the border, runs up to the fence and clips it uh, before calling back to his clients. I want to see the version where it's not a human and it's just like Wiley Coyote. Well, like that, a cartoon. Yeah, the Pixar version. Yeah. <laughs> We cut to a crowded U.S. Border Patrol office in La Mesa, California. Charles Bronson enters as Jeb. He walks into the station wearing a cowboy hat. Apparently, he works here, and a coworker advises him to grab a Guatemalan or maybe an El Salvadorian because there's a lot of work to do today. Suddenly, a new guy enters the building. This is Bruno Kirby as Jimmy Fonte, and he offers to shake Jeb's hand. He's here on detail from New York. Jimmy is here alone, even though Jeb asked for 12 men from the New York office. One of the other men in the office takes a pollero to a holding cell, Jimmy asks what that means, and Jeb translates, he's a guide. So basically the same thing as a coyote. They're especially hated by the Border Patrol because they're seen as taking advantage of the people trying to cross the border. A group here today were abandoned by their guide once he had his money and they were over the line, but without food. So they were basically just starving in the desert. 
Jeb tells Willie to show Jimmy around. Willie shows them the territory that they're in charge of on a big map. It's about 1,200 square miles. They used to take in 100 aliens a month. Now they're pulling in 3,000 a month. And for every one they catch, three get away. Willie asks how his Spanish is, and when Jimmy says it's impeccable, he puts him to work immediately translating immigrants for the office. Jimmy is less competent than he claimed in Spanish. Well, I mean, I feel like you could know Spanish really well, and then if somebody who's a native speaker just starts talking at, you know, a mm-hmm. quick pace, you're, yeah. you're going to be lost instantly. So. Right, but that's where I would say, it's all right, mas o menos. I wouldn't say <laughs> impeccable, <laughs> impeccable, because then they're going to ask you to translate people. Uh, at the end of the day, the men pile out of the building into the parking lot and air their grievances. Wilford Brimley's mad because he keeps catching the same kid over and over and over again, and he feels like his job is futile. Bruno Kirby is depressed because he just sent a guy to Mexico who sold his whole family business for a ticket to America. They head out to the canyons because they've been told there's a group that way. Sleep tight, America. Your tax dollars at work. We cut to... Little Tecate Peak, three miles north of the border, where Ed Harris is leading a group through the canyons. This is actor Ed Harris playing himself. And the credits mm-hmm. at the no. beginning uh, said introducing, I believe. Introducing, yes. Yeah. He, he does have a film before this, but this was his first like major role in anything. Suddenly, Harris has them sit down at the top of a hill. He offers to give his second-in-command, Arturo, a little bit of field training and asks if he knows what a sensor is. He walks Arturo down the path a bit and digs up a seismic sensor used to send signals to Border Patrol indicating immigrants. Presumably digging it out of the ground just now was enough (laughs) jostling to set it off if it can detect footsteps several feet away. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. And I guess maybe the idea is that it's sustained motion because they're coming over in groups mm-hmm. and so yeah. a, a you know a, an a, animal a, wouldn't a set brief it off. jostle wouldn't yeah. yeah wouldn't set it off like an animal so or graboids i guess yeah. this is equivalent to that but they walk right up to it and pull it out of the ground and then cut the wires on it it's like i get that you're trying to show it to him but just cut the wire first yes then, then show, show it to, to him, him. <laughs> but also how do you get to it without setting it off um harris tells arturo that he learned these tricks in nam courtesy of the u.s government Ed Harris advises them to split up, and Arturo takes the group one way, while Harris and his men go another. Just before they break into two, Harris calls out a kid from Arturo's group and says, You're with us. Come over here. (laughs) This is where you get the 800 yards north of the border. Yeah, Ote Mesa. Ote Mesa, 800 yards north. Uh, A helicopter with a spotlight finds and follows a group of immigrants through the wilderness. The group is running through a shallow river until they're met with a line of Border Patrol agents on the ground. And we cut to California Highway 94, 16 miles east of San Diego. <laughs> so precise. A truck pulls over to the side of the road with a facade of produce boxes built in as a roof over the bed. Suddenly, Ed Harris and his men rush out of a nearby storm drain and pile into the back of the truck. The driver insists Harris right up front with him, but he assures the man that that would be a red flag for La Migra, and instead offers the kid the spot up front to pose as the driver's son. In the cab, the kid and driver talk about the kid's plans in America. Apparently his mom lives in La Jolla and has work for him, and he plans to pay his own way in the world. Wilford Brimley passes the truck in a police cruiser before spinning around to pursue it. When they pull over, Brimley copies down the plates. He asks the driver if he can have a look in the back to be sure the tomatoes, to be sure tomatoes are all they have in the truck, and when they open the back doors, he can see it's full of immigrants and asks them to open the other side. So how hard would it have been? You've bothered to make a facade on top of the truck. To just like, put a few boxes against the back? Just mm-hmm. make a facade, like a vertical facade that you just tack in there after mm-hmm. everybody's inside. Yeah. Like, seriously. I think it would have been pretty easy. Pretty and I was darn like, easy. Given how willing he was to open the back of this truck, I was sure that's what we were about to see. I, I, was, yeah. sh- I was sure, too. I'm like, you're going to open it up and see more tomatoes, and then we're going to move on with our yeah, lives. Yeah, there's just a shelf that closes in, like double doors. Which is what made the next thing more shocking. Yeah. <laughs> but when they open the other door, Ed Harris is sitting there with a shotgun trained on the Border Patrol guard, and he fires the shotgun into Brimley's gut and some of it hits the kid standing behind him. Close it up. 
and Brimley just drops. He's dead. Yeah. Pretty much that, instantly. That was the end of him in this movie, which is super disappointing. Yeah. He doesn't die a lot in movies. Are you campaigning to kill Wilfred Brimley more? No. But I, I don't want him to become, like, you know, fodder. I, w- I want him to survive till at least the third act. You know, the thing. Then we kill him. The thing <laughs> held out. <laughs> Once we get to know him more. <laughs> and so it's truly heartbreaking. <laughs> The kid is writhing in the street until Harris walks over to apologize before hitting him with a kill shot. <laughs> Sorry. And then he moves to dispose of the bodies, just dragging them by their feet off the side of the road. Harris hops in the cruiser and he rips off the top sheet of paper where Brimley had copied down the license plate. He pulls the car off the road and shuts off the lights before they drive away. The next day, the road is blocked off while Border Patrol investigates the scene, which I think would probably not be their jurisdiction. But I don't really know. Uh, I don't think it is because I, I think that maybe they were alerted and got there sooner than anybody else. Yeah. Um, it seems like Jeb is like stealing evidence. Uh, yeah, it yeah. so, does seem like that. So I think that I think that it isn't his jurisdiction, and he knows it, and so yeah. he's trying to do whatever he can before anybody else gets there. Yeah. Checking the pockets of the deceased, Jeb finds the kid's mother's address. Jeb inspects the footprints in the dust and determines which ones are Wilford's, which ones are the kids, and which ones are the shooters. Luckily, nobody's tracked over these because none of this area is roped off and there's a lot of cops and photographers just walking around. Jimmy Fonte asks if the tomatoes probably came from the truck, just as the FBI pulls up to take over the scene. Jeb tells him to run the tomatoes to the lab, and Jimmy conspicuously removes his hat to cover the fruits he's holding as he walks away. (laughs) The FBI guys, or Phoebes, as Jeb calls them, decide the kid must have been a mule or something. Clearly not an innocent bystander or he wouldn't have been shot. We cut two workers in a strawberry field and my Camarillo senses started tingling. (laughs) It turns out this is McGrath Ranch in Ventura, just 15 miles down the road from us. (laughs) But the sign out front reads, C.J. Richards Ranch. We see an older gentleman with a cane, presumably Mr. Richards, walking through the property and into a room with a miniature model with the sector of land Jeb's office is set to patrol. Ed Harris is across the room drawing dotted lines on a map of the U.S., and Richard asks if he knows anything about the dead border patrol officer, and Harris insists, everything went smoothly with his pickup, nothing to worry about. And this is a really elaborate room. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, I was surprised that there was something of this scale going on. I mean, this is like caligula level map rooming yeah well they're bringing in a (laughs) shit ton of money as we're about to find out but also if you're trying to keep it hidden like it's a much harder room to hide yeah like Mm -hmm. you're gonna notice that this this should be paper maps that you set on fire at the end of the day yeah well or at least you should be able to like matilda them closed like with like you know the the chalkboard falls over the the map of the border when Mm -hmm. the you know the when miss trumbull walks in but he's turnbull trunchbull Trench bowl. Trench there you bowl. go. <laughs> uh, but he's got the whole fucking, you know, the town from Beetlejuice, like, yeah. model. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, where are you going to hide that? It's a beautiful model, too. Yeah, it's really great. Here we have a factory who builds models factory. of factories. <laughs> Back in the office, Jeb informs his men that although the FBI have officially taken over the investigation, his men will be working full time to track down the shooter. He's got paramilitary boots with a gash in the left heel. I don't remember him sharing this info with the Phoebes, but maybe he cares less about the guy getting caught than he does about revenge. No vacations, no sick pay, no time off. And no adhering to the process of law or people's (laughs) rights. Feel free to taint the chain of evidence as much as you need to. No no search without probable cause, all that good stuff. Hey, we're Border Patrol. It's what we do all the time, right? I mean, they really do... Like basically tell him, they tell him like no, no probable cause. None of that. What did he say? There's a line. He says, "I don't want anybody coming back here and giving me all that crap about probable cause." Yeah, the border patrol car finds tire marks on the side of the road near the storm drain where the immigrants collected the night before. They move into the tunnel and find footprints in the mud. Jeb and Jimmy follow the path away from the tunnel up into the hills, and they find the source of the immigration. Jimmy gets a little impatient with their meandering, and Jeb calls him over to carve a marker in the bottom of his boot so he doesn't waste time in the future following his own footprints. He talks about another Border Patrol agent who got lost doing that once. Well, he followed himself right up his own ass. We never did see him again. But 
like at this point I'm thinking, okay, so I'm going to mark this boot. And then I was certain that there was going to be some sort of twist at the end where this guy was also a border patrol guy who oh. had marked his boots and mm. was like playing both sides or something like that. Because I was, I, I was like, why? Th- it seems like this is also a marked boot. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought that it was going to be that he literally, now that his boot was different, he was going to misidentify the notes from before he notched the boot mm. and he was going to follow his own footsteps back to the car. They come up on a seismic sensor, pull down to the ground with its wires severed. Back at the ranch, we see the truck driver from the night before loading up a barn. He heads to his truck for today and tells Arturo what happened last night. Harris's character is just pulling up in a car and tells them to load up this new moving truck with everyone in the barn. It looks like he's going to drive them to where they'll be working. The driver tells Ed Harris's character, who we learn here is named Hotchkiss, that they'll have to take the long way around Los Angeles to avoid suspicion. And he says, we're not going to Los Angeles. He instructs Arturo to take them across I-10 to Phoenix, where they'll get on a plane to Chicago, and they have tickets for everybody. Yeah. I don't think that's possible now. Yeah, I I don't think, not now, but I think then it was totally possible. I think that back in 1980, buying a ticket ticket. for a plane is like buying a ticket for a bus. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. There will be people waiting for them in Chicago. We cut to the San Diego Financial District, and we see Michael Lerner as Mr. Lydell, whose name is on the building. He's getting a business forecast from uh, Richards from the farm. Specifically, they're talking about how much they spend getting these immigrants into the company and how much they make as a result of employing them. It sounds like, from this analysis of their business model, Hodgkiss is a very important part of this operation because he just is magical with his with his numbers the the amount of people he's able to get i i yeah i I mean it must be because i'm kind of shocked at the idea that we could have such a huge sort of uh i don't know crime syndicate i don't know what this is but but some somebody who's making this amount of money off of getting people across the border because i feel like you'd have to have to be doing it at such a scale yeah Yeah. i mean unless these people are 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 more valuable than i understand like it it just seems like you'd have to be pushing a lot of of folks through but they're they're getting paid on both sides too because they're getting paid by the people coming in and they're getting paid by the company that they send them i guess i mean i think relative to you know the the, what they're making on 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 selling these people to you know folks who need employees uh they're making nothing on bringing them in because you know uh, it's like 300 bucks a person yeah a a family's entire life savings Mm. is not going to be much right but if you have 300 bucks a person and you bring over 2,000 people in a day then that adds up suddenly that's six hundred thousand dollars yeah but it's but it sounds like they're not actually doing that kind of volume on a regular not basis. regularly no but on a monthly basis maybe if it wasn't for hotchkiss we couldn't get more than a thousand of these men a month mr lydell shows the man a newspaper headline about the border patrol shooting and warns him that they better not be involved because he needs to ship two thousand workers by christmas and this would really back them up he has big plans for next year expanding their deliveries to seventy five hundred people a month with a thousand being women yeah, that's I, crazy i feel like that level of human trafficking you have to find an alternate to just running across the border yeah. you gotta be yeah. smuggling these people in in there's other just ways. a solid line going 24 yeah. <laughs> 7 as the men leave lydell's office he tells them you know eventually this might be a legitimate business and could be listed on the stock market and then the other guy says a racial slur about mexicans Strange. yeah Trading in wetback futures. There's a lot of those in yeah. this movie on all sides. Mm-hmm. Like they, for a big portion of the movie, they're just referring to them as wets. That's that's their nickname for these immigrants. Jeb pulls into the driveway of the address that he collected from the dead kid on the side of the road. When a woman answers the door, he tells her freely that he found the address in the pocket of a boy who was shot to death on the Mexican border. She doesn't react as much as I wanted her to. Mm-hmm. So right away, I suspected it wasn't her kid. But even even still, she should have been a little upset about this. Yeah. Especially when he's, when she goes, tell that woman over there what you just told me. Yeah. Like, like don't Very brace. Very callous. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she doesn't prepare her for it at all. Mm -hmm. She just says, hey, Elena, uh, this guy wants to talk to you. And she goes and gets, I guess, her maid or housekeeper. I don't know if she's just nanny. Yeah. Um, And the mother of the the dead son 
in another room is speaking with uh, Charles Bronson and we follow the, the homeowner back to the room where her kids were sitting and we just hear the mother start crying. Uh, we cut back and he's asking Elena to join him to help identify the body and then when she asks why he's doing this, he answers because he lost a friend in the same shooting. He, he doesn't want any trouble for her because she's not here legally either, but he wants her to come with him so they can at least be sure that they have the right kid. Doesn't he kind of blackmail her into doing Not that yet. though oh, okay no. that's later okay at the morgue she confirms the dead boy is her son and we cut to brimley's funeral jeb mentions that he was two months from retirement that he was or brimley was brimley, brimley was, was ah. when he died yeah uh they get a call on the radio from the fbi that they found the truck from the night of the shooting when jeb gets to the truck it's crashed into a ravine off the side of the freeway the back is open and there's a dead body shot in the back lying face down on the ground this is the guy who that we just saw yeah it was supposed to pick people up and take them to the airport right well no he, no no that he, was he was the driver the night that this all happened yeah right the, the that old, was the, the same old, guy yeah yeah but uh arturo was the one who was oh, sent to okay to phoenix so they just killed the other guy because they were yeah. like we don't need you anymore and you saw too much yeah yeah fbi is there taking notes and same as before they are certain this has to do with drugs and not immigration and advise contacting the Drug Enforcement Agency. The FBI offered their condolences to Jeb on the death of his theory that this had anything to do with immigration. Apparently, they took the driver from that night to this ravine and killed him before planting empty bags with traces of marijuana into the back of the truck to throw the authorities off their scent. Jeb's boss tells him to let the FBI handle it because it's their jurisdiction. We cut to the San Diego Barrio, Jeb is here to visit Elena Morales in private, and she kicks out her coworkers to have a conversation with Jeb. She has other women that are working in her house in some form. Um, this is where Jeb unveils his totally bonkers plan to catch the murderous coyote. He intends for Elena and him to pose as a married couple and drive down to Mexico and get re-smuggled in using the same coyotes. He says he can't do it alone because his Spanish isn't good enough to be convincing. And she should do this if she wants to help find her son's killer, which is already like, no, that's not my job. Like, that's your mm -hmm. job. And then he takes it a grosser step to say, if you don't do it, I'm going to organize your deportation. Even though before I said I wasn't going to do that, yeah. I'm actually going to do that now if you don't cooperate with my plan. So we see them walking across the footbridge into Mexico. And literally the second they've crossed the border, we hear a woman screaming uh, there's a car overheating in the stopped traffic at the borderline, and the driver just gets out to run away. <laughs> but the border patrol agents have street smarts, and they've they've been in this situation before. I take it, and they go to open the hood and find a woman who was trying to get smuggled in in the engine of this car, and mm -hmm. she's literally like sitting with her back against the overheating engine yeah. of the vehicle. She has burn marks on her face. And the men just lift her up and carry her away from the car. She probably would have died if these people didn't go and open it right away. And now we're in Tijuana. In a bar, Elena speaks with a bartender who can connect her to a coyote. A federale enters the bar, and Jeb thinks trouble is brewing. But Elena tells him, it's okay. This guy's super corrupt. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about it. He comes to sit at their table, and he starts talking to Elena. She warns him that Jeb is her cousin, and that he's, like, mentally handicapped, so he can't mm -hmm. respond to uh questioning uh he tells I hope her his spanish is good enough to know that she called him an idiot yeah <laughs> yeah uh he tells her that she can get a discount for crossing the border in exchange for sex like she did last time but she says i have money i have money this time i don't have to do that i don't need your fucking discount i was talking to your friend yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's like i don't have money in spanish i guess uh no tengo dinero we see them riding in the bed of a pickup truck and cut to Mine Canyon Riverbed 13 miles east of San Diego. At night, the coyote leads them over the border and uses a night vision scope to check the way. Jeb tells Elena to figure out where he got it, and she moves to ask the man. He says that it was given to him by the Anglo who runs this operation. They call him the Marine. 
this is the very Ed Harris coming. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know why he's saying all this to her. I'm surprised that she just flat out asked him straight up. Like yeah. she didn't work her way up to it. She was just like, where did that come from? Who gave it to you? Yeah, well, except she was being kind of flirty with him. It's like, oh, yeah, this a little is bit. cool. Yeah. Where did this come from? How'd you get it's this ma- thing? It's magical. This yeah. is super neat. But he, he lets her try it out <laughs> and then she takes it and beats him to death with it. No, that's not true. Uh, but he says Hotchkiss is the one who took it. He doesn't use the name Hotchkiss. He just calls him the Marine. Suddenly, the whole group of immigrants and the coyote are intercepted by three men with knives. The men order them to place any jewelry or money they have with them on the ground. One of them pulls a young woman out of the group to rape when the coyote loses his patience and jumps up to attack another of the bandits. A gunfight breaks out as everyone runs for cover. Arturo, their coyote, runs back to the parked car around the corner and pulls away before Jeb and Elena can catch up to him. Well, and the guy with the gun is just opening fire at anybody. Yeah. It's like, what, including what, his own friends. It's like, what, what is your plan here? Like, what, what are you hoping to accomplish by shooting random people? Like, yeah. brandishing it as a threat to hand over your goods is one thing, but now you're just openly committing murders. Yeah. Jeb and Elena walk right up to a group of Border Patrol agents who try to arrest them for a moment before they recognize Jeb. He takes a patrol car and leaves with Elena. As he drops her off at her home, he tells her that she should get in touch after the holidays and he'll try to get her permanent resident status in exchange for her assistance on this mission. Yeah, that's an important thing to note is that this is all taking place over Christmas right. time. Yeah. Like it, when it when it opened up and it said December 1979, I was like, why why so specific with the year? Um, but even so, just to have like this Christmas like scheme yeah. that they'll come up with in just a few minutes. As like it just seems awful weird to, to set it during Christmas. And there was also a Christmas tree in the living room when uh, yeah. Bronson tells the woman that her son is dead. I mean, I get the concept because they were looking for a, a day when there might not be a lot of Border Patrol around. Yeah. Right. But aside from that, and, and, uh, it's just kind of irrelevant. Mm-hmm. He pulls up to another house and it looks like this one's his because it's completely empty with just a chair and a TV tray. Later we see a car pull up across the street and this is Jimmy who just lets himself in. Jeb is passed out in a chair with an empty hungry man in his lap and two beer cans on the table beside him. Jimmy knows all about Jeb's undercover border crossing experiment, but he's here to tell Jeb some good news. He got the results of the tomatoes, and the university lab showed traces of extremely toxic pesticide that's only used by major corporations in the area, and of the 86 companies who use this chemical, only six of them grow tomatoes. Go ahead. Well, I just wanted to tell you that... uh... Out of the 86, only six grow tomatoes. Hmm? What? Six? Jeb organizes the Border Patrol agents again to locate an Anglo man responsible for this operation. We cut to a crowd of immigrants being arrested in a strawberry field. A lot of the exteriors here look like Camarillo to me, or maybe Somas. Um, They radio into Jeb about the men they found in the field, but he says, let them go unless you see any Anglos in this bunch. Jeb and Jimmy find a group of workers living in this ramshackle fort off the road that they've constructed from blankets and sticks, basically. Jimmy asks how long they've been here, and they tell him they've lived in this shed for two months working at the ranch that, that neighbors this this shanty town they've built. Border Patrol agents pull up to C.J. Richards' ranch, and he gets a heads up from Arturo. When Arturo sees them get out of the car, he recognizes Jeb from the group that he brought in last night and says as much to Hotchkiss, and they realize they're fucked. Um, It would have been even worse if Hotchkiss was leading them because Hotchkiss recognized Jeb right away. He's like, oh, that's the guy from the local Border Patrol office. And if it had been him, he'd have been like, what? Fuck this guy. Kill him (laughs) right now. Outside, Jeb and Jimmy ask if there are people in the barn, and Richard says no. They ask if they can have some water, and he points them to the hose. But nothing really comes of him recognizing him, does it? I mean, they hit Arturo. If they didn't hide Arturo, then it would have been a dead giveaway to Jeb that this is the place that they're Mm -hmm. getting all the people. Okay. Um, But uh, Jeb finds a footprint near the hose, and it's the shooter's footprint. He can tell from the the gash on the heel of the boot, and uh, they know he must work here at the ranch. They start to move for the house, but Richard denies them access without a warrant, and Hotchkiss sneaks around them, bidding the patrolman farewell before driving away. Also, not wearing his boots. Right. Like he's wearing, like, nicer dress shoes. Yeah. 
Maybe because he saw them looking at the mud. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like, ah, shit. Richards goes to meet with Lydell again, and he suggests slowing down the operation to avoid suspicion because Border Patrol's been at his ranch. Lydell asks how long it would take to get the additional 2,000 workers he needs by the end of the month, and Richard explains, I could do it in one night, that's not the point. And so Lydell's like, oh, that's great, just do it in one night. So specifically Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, the midnight between those, uh, Richard's farm is going to bring in 50 coyotes to go over this plan, and they're going to move 2,000 people. Each coyote is getting a $1,000 bonus for working on Christmas. Jeb spies on the property as all the coyotes pull out of the ranch. Jeb follows Arturo's car to a nearby restroom where he attacks Arturo. He shoves his head into a toilet asking for information about the night of the shooting, and Arturo freely gives up that the Marine, El Marino, is the one who did the killing, and he says the guy's name is Hotchkiss and that it's a white guy. So yep. he's like fully out of the dude. Yeah, but it doesn't really, like, he already suspected that that was the dude. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess he's kind of confirmed it, but yeah. it doesn't get him any closer to catching the guy. Yeah, it's also not proper procedure for extracting testimony. Um, he makes a deal with Jeb that in exchange for Hotchkiss, he will go free, which is, I don't think, something that Jeb could promise him at all. Nope. Because he wouldn't be involved in the actual trial of this he's not a police officer he shouldn't even be arresting these guys (laughs) yeah jeb agrees that if he actually arrests hotchkiss that arturo has done his duty the border patrol office is buzzing with activity they're planning a raid on the ranch tonight the door to the barn opens very early in the morning and the coyotes start driving out four large trucks jeb and his men watch through binoculars as the trucks pull out so this is like the most suspicious way I think you could possibly do this because they talk over the plan about how there's like this schedule and everybody has to be exactly on time and Mm -hmm. they're they're staggering it so that they're all 30 minutes apart. So I'm like, why are you all leaving at exactly the same time? Also, why do you have to start from here? You should start your trucks at your separate homes to go pick the people up. You don't have to start from the same place. Right. And it's just like, I explained the plan. Now all the trucks are here and now you leave from here. This is super, super conspicuous. Yeah. (laughs) Jeb and his men watch through binoculars as the trucks pull out. And then once they're gone, they do a quick check of the property and decide it's mostly clean, but there's a light on in the barn and they can hear voices inside. They enter the barn, guns drawn, and arrest two men sitting at desks inside immediately. Richard, wearing a full tuxedo, starts out of his house and gets into his parked car outside, but before he can close the driver's side door, the hand of a Border Patrol agent rips him out of the car, and this is Jeb. It's obvious from the miniature of the Border Patrol territory what's going on in this barn, and it seems like an unnecessary risk that they could have just had a map that they could dispose of when they weren't using it. They get a call that one of the trucks is returning to the ranch, and when the truck stops, Arturo hops out to open the barn and then open the truck so the immigrants can load into the barn. La Migra pops out and sends all the immigrants into the barn and all of the coyotes into the office and then puts everyone under arrest. I mean, unless Arturo gave away the whole plan, I'm not super clear on how they knew that that this sort of you know, plan to just let the trucks just keep coming in yeah. and collecting all the people was going to work because I would imagine that at one point somebody would radio back to the barn and expect an answer. Yeah, I, I think that he must have given everything away because Arturo even tells him that Hotchkiss is going to be in the last truck of the day. Yeah, I guess. I, I But it's just, you know, it's just terribly convenient that nobody ever radios yeah, back Yeah, there wasn't any kind of a test to make sure they weren't caught. Yeah. Some kind of all clear. Yeah. Like like if if the flag is, you know, if this flag is flying higher than this flag, like it's all clear to come in. Yeah. Because th- part of the plan for the Border Patrol is that they have to catch these guys on the property. Right. Yeah. It, it doesn't work. They can't press charges against the, the, the guy if they catch them off the property. Yeah. A second truck pulls up and they do the same thing. It has to be terrifying for them because they know that one of these trucks is being driven by a guy who has no qualms about shooting immigration officials. They now have the entire office filled with handcuffed coyotes and a barn filled with illegal immigrants, and by morning, the barn is packed with about 2,000 immigrants. We slowly push into Jeb thinking about where Hotchkiss is. 
he was supposed to be driving the last truck but he still hasn't shown up and then we cut to hotchkiss uncharacteristically riding in the cab with the last coyote as the truck approaches jeb reminds charlie another agent to be careful because this guy is dangerous when hotchkiss jumps out of the truck he's holding an uzi in his hand with his finger on the trigger he jumps out in front of the house instead of the barn and he tells the driver to continue hotchkiss hears the commotion when the driver is arrested and just starts blasting this uzi Mm -hmm. at the truck that he just got out of he's trying to kill jeb but he could really kill anybody he hops into a trans am parked over a row of bushes a a transom what's a a transom transom? (laughs) (laughs) flashing back to my earlier notes yeah Yeah. i like that reference (laughs) you gotta listen to all the episodes if you want to catch all the jokes hunter ladies and gentlemen (laughs) jeb moves to follow him in his truck he drives the truck straight over a crop of lettuce to cut the corner on this field to catch up with the transom. He chases the transom <laughs> to a dead end where Hotchkiss gets out and starts running into the wilderness and Jeb follows. And this is like a super scary moment for him because he loses track of him. Mm-hmm. And then he's just wandering through these plants well, looking around. Yeah, this dude has already just like sprayed your truck with bullets. Like yeah. he has no issues with killing you on the spot. And now you're alone. It's mm-hmm. not like anybody's around to see him do this or stop him or anything like that. So I don't know, as they walk through the woods, why he doesn't just turn around and shoot the guy and yeah. then take off. But he's just sitting there listening carefully, uh, but all he can hear are birds. Hotchkiss circles back to the cars, but before he can get in the GMC truck, Jeb hears him and pulls back the hammer on his handgun. End of the road. Hotchkiss turns around and fires his Uzi, nicking Jeb's arm before Jeb takes him out with a single shot. Jeb walks over to Hotchkiss's corpse and lifts his leg to verify that the boot belongs to the man who killed his friend. Later in the courthouse, we see Richards exiting after a trial. A title reads, Guilty Transporting and Harboring Illegal Aliens, 2 to 5 Years and a $5,000 Fine. Next, we see Lydell coming out, he goes down the steps, and we freeze frame for another time. Or not. Okay, he's still moving. He gets mm-hmm. the whole way outside of the courthouse. <laughs> uh, and then some reporters ask what he thinks about how the trial went, and he's very pleased. And then we get the freeze frame that says, not guilty, insufficient evidence. We freeze frame and well, cut. Well, he says, he, he says something else, too, though. He says, system works. Right. Mm-hmm. Which is just infuriating. Well, I mean. Well, he's right. Yeah. It works for him, it's, it's yeah. the system that he's talking about. The system that I paid good money for works. But I guess we can assume that Carl Richards did not sell him out. I guess, yeah. Because otherwise they would have sufficient evidence. I or think. he tried to sell him out and it was just uh, it was just like, well, you well, told me these were people were had the right to work know, in America. He, yeah, the way he probably set up this company is to insulate himself from wh- whatever is happening with bringing these people in. Richards should have been recording those meetings that they yeah. had in the mm-hmm. building if he wanted. Well, that's why they were always using the pr- like words like product. Although I think California is a, a two party uh, consent. Yeah, yeah, two party consent for recording. Unless you're recording a criminal activity. Yeah, but I don't know that was was the Michael Lerner character in California. Or was he in yeah. New York? Yeah, he, he was, was in California. California. He was in San Diego. In the um, financial district. Yeah. According to very specific. 800, 800 yards <laughs> east of the <laughs> local deli. Um, we, uh, as everyone's walking away from the courthouse, suddenly the picture freezes and the audio cuts at the same time. And it's just very jarring. It's a weird way to uh, end the film. But then we get the last title and it says... In 1979, more than one million undocumented aliens were apprehended crossing the border into the United States. It is estimated more than twice that number of undocumented aliens successfully enter the country every year. And that's the end of our film. Yeah, I mean, I think, of course, that it's obviously timely to be talking about these things now. Sure. Except this movie is just very different than I imagine this kind of movie would be made now because... Yeah, the the illegal immigrants and you know all of that sort of, was just sort of a a backdrop. It was just kind of a facade to tell this story of a guy who's obsessed with you know aven- avenging guy. his yeah. friend's death. Uh, but I like that I felt not just because I know that they had a guy on set telling them this stuff, yeah. but that it felt very accurate to the process. 
Yeah, I think from the perspective of the Border Patrol, yeah. yes, I, I think you're right. Um, I think the Border Patrol operates differently today than they did then. And I think they would be less sympathetic to the the situation. Like, it seems like the only people they're mad at are the coyotes. They're not mad at the immigrants at all. Um. I don't know that they're, they're they're not mad at them, but I don't know that they're sympathetic to them. Well, it seemed like Wilford Brimley felt bad that this kid he kept capturing, and then the and obviously uh, um, Bruno Kirby felt bad about the guy where he's like, oh, I'm, he had to sell his family business to come here, and now I'm sending him right back home where he doesn't have a family business anymore. Like that sucks. I don't want to do that to people. Like they feel awful about it. Yeah. Where now people are getting, you know, arrested for leaving water in the desert. So that these people don't get stranded. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it just seems completely backwards to me. Um, but yeah, I, I think that the story works really well. I think the pacing is fine and none of it didn't make sense to me. Yeah. I'm astonished at the number of people that 50 coyotes can be expected to bring across the border in a day. Mm-hmm. That's pretty crazy. Um, but yeah. Our director here, writer-director Gerald Friedman... This was his second film after 72's Kansas City Bomber. He has lots of TV work, including ghost directing the MacGyver pilot, which is officially credited to Alan Smithy. He also directed X-Files episodes Born Again and Ghost in the Machine. Uh, Co-writer Stephen Klein, this was his first screenwriting credit. He has lots of TV credits and six episodes of The Cosby Show, and he he was a special effects technician on Wedding Crashers. (laughs) which I thought was a weird credit. Um, producer, Lord Lou Grade. So far this year, we've covered Saturn Three and Raise the Titanic of his productions. He's also a producer on The Muppet Show and Muppet Movie and The Great Muppet Caper. As a result, the character of Lou Zealand is named after Lou Grade. Oh. He also produced The Dark Crystal Movie. DP Tak Fujimoto, this is our third Tak Fujimoto title after the Art Linson productions Where the Buffalo Roam and Melvin and Howard. Before this year, he worked on Star Wars, Badlands, Death Race 2000. He would later DP the MacGyver pilot from the same director. Pretty in Pink, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Silence of the Lambs, Philadelphia, Grumpier Old Men, That Thing You Do, The Sixth Sense, and a few other Shyamalan productions, including Devil, which uh, you guys worked on, but I did not. (laughs) Uh, I forgot (laughs) forgot (laughs) I gave you my job, Richard. Yeah, (laughs) for the last day. I don't even. a month, I think. Yeah, I didn't get any credits, but it's fine. (laughs) Did you get a credit in Devil? Uh, I don't remember. Probably. Yeah. Uh, nobody ever saw that, right? Nobody saw that. <laughs> <laughs> Just remember that that clip that went online of like, as soon as it said, from M. Night Shyamalan, and the whole yeah. audience just goes, just He didn't direct it, though. I know. He, he just, just produced, produced it. it. And, like, he, and he had the Shyamalan Chronicles uh, or the M. Night Chronicles or something yeah. like that before it. Charles Bronson played Jeb Maynard. Uh, he's Harmonica in Once Upon a Time in the West. He's Paul Kersey in the Death Wish films. He's Bernardo O'Reilly in The Magnificent Seven. And he's Danny in The Great Escape. Bruno Kirby is Jimmy Fonte. He was Ed Farillo in City Slickers. He's Jess in When Harry Met Sally. He's Young Clemenza in Godfather Part Two. And he's Frenchie in Good Morning Vietnam. Yeah. <laughs> Just going to refer to oh, his character within a character. Lieutenant Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant Steve, Lieutenant Steve. We had him earlier this year as Hunter S. Thompson's impatient editor in Where the Buffalo Roam, another Tak Fujimoto product. Uh, we'll see him next as Jay in Modern Romance next year. Burt Remsen played Carl J. Richards, C.J. Richards. He was Commander Cates in Code of Silence. He's a bartender in Dick Tracy. We had him earlier this year as Delno Baptiste in Carney, and he'll be back for Inside Moves before the end of the year. Michael Lerner was Henry Lydell. This is his third appearance for the year after Baltimore Bullet and Coast to Coast. He's in the MacGyver pilot also yeah. with the same DP and director. He played Jack Lipnick in Barton Fink, Fulton in Elf, and Mayor Ebert in Godzilla. Kenneth McMillan played Malcolm Wallace. This was his fourth appearance for this year after Little Miss Marker, Hide in Plain Sight, and Carney alongside Burt Ramson. He's Baron Vladimir Harkonnen in Dune. He's Michael Schlumberg in Amadeus and Captain Clarence O'Connell in Armed and Dangerous. I was waiting for this character to turn out to be evil. Yeah. Especially because he's he's harping on Jeb like, 
really, you should drop this. This is j- their jurisdiction. Let's leave it mm-hmm. alone. And I thought it was going to turn out that there was a guy in the Border Patrol that was in on it with Lydell, but they don't go that way with well, the story. Well, yeah, I was, I was waiting for uh, Hotchkins to... Hotchkins, Hopkins, Hotchkiss, Hotchkiss. What a, what dumb names this movie yeah. has? Yeah. Hotchkiss and Jeb, Jeb and Jimmy. It's like no, 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 <laughs> no. no. Yeah, I couldn't keep the names straight. Um, I was waiting for him to be in the border patrol because I was like, you know, he said he learned these things from Nam, but I really, I wanted it to actually be. It's like, well, no, I was a border patrol agent. And I realized it was much more lucrative to know their secrets and be right. on this end. Yeah, of it would turn out he was he yeah. was a part of their group before, uh, and thus the boot. Right, the market. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, that would make sense. Yeah. That, Why didn't circle. they do that? That's what I'm saying. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I wrote a better movie in my head. <laughs> Ed Harris played Hotch Kiss. Before this, he had appeared only in a small role for Coma, written and directed by Michael Crichton, fitting as he would later play the main villain of HBO's latest adaptation of Crichton's Westworld. We'll see him next in George Romero's Night Riders about people riding motorcycles in full plate mail next year. Nice. Uh, oh, I remember that. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> uh, he's John Glenn in The Right Stuff. He's Bud Brigman in The Abyss. He's Gene Krantz in Apollo 13. He's Kristoff in The Truman Show. He's Jackson Pollock in Pollock. And he'll be showing up soon in Top Gun Maverick, if that ever comes out. Carmen Marcello played Elena Morales We'll have her as Teresa Ramirez in Stir Crazy later this year. She also appears as Dolores in Blood In, Blood Out. Enrique Castillo played Arturo. Uh, He was Claire's father in Deja Vu. He played Montana in Blood In, Blood Out. And he's Caesar in 25 episodes of Weeds. Wilford Brimley was Scooter Jackson. That's the perfect name for the Wilford Brimley character. Yeah. (laughs) Scooter Jackson. Uh, We had him earlier this year for Brubaker. He's Dr. Blair in The Thing. He's Ben Luckett in Cocoon, Pop Fisher in The Natural. And as of this recording, we just lost him earlier this month, August 1st of this year. Hmm. Um, Big bummer. Norman Alden played Willie Lambert. He's the voice of Sir Kay in Sword in the Stone and Kranix in Transformers the Movie. He's Lou in Back to the Future and Cameraman Bill in Ed Wood. He appeared earlier this year in a movie called Cloud Dancer, that I'll be reviewing for a minisode on its 41st anniversary. But we didn't find it in time for the show. John Ashton plays Charlie Monroe. He played Sergeant Taggart in Beverly Hills Cop. He's Marvin Dorfler in Midnight Run. And we'll see him next in Honky Tonk Freeway next year. <laughs> Charles Cyphers played Ski. Who is Ski? Someone is named Ski in this? Ski. We had him earlier this year as Dan O'Bannon in The Fog. <laughs> and uh, he's back next year for two more Carpenter scripts, Escape from New York and Halloween 2. He also appears alongside Bronson again in Death Wish 2. He's also Brackett in the first Halloween, Starker in Assault on Precinct 13, and Charles Donovan in Major League. Jerry DeWild played the police photographer he also plays Jerry in MacGyver Pilot. <laughs> uh, I think that's the that's literally the name of the pilot who is in the cage, right, Jerry? Was it? I don't know who Jerry would be otherwise. But yeah, so he was in that MacGyver Pilot that Tak Fujimoto, uh, Gerald Friedman, and Michael Lerner all worked on. Virgil Fry played Bandit Leader. He was a biker and easy rider. That narrows it down. Uh, he was McGregor in Graduation Day and Lieutenant Dime in Revenge of the Ninja. And the last credit I have here was Luis Contreras, who plays Bandit. He's a biker in Pee-wee's Big Adventure. He plays Lupo in Red Heat, Commander Ramirez in Last Man Standing, and Real Thing in Blood In, Blood Out. So we had three characters from Blood In, Blood Out in this one. Did you mention our editor here? No, I didn't. Who's the editor? Our editor is John Link. Okay. He's got a lot of good credits. We have um, The Mighty Ducks. D2, but... Uh, Didn't we just have the Mighty Ducks director in uh, Fooling we? Around? Or, oh, we might have. Uh, Loving Couples, I think. He played the cop. But he did uh, He did, He did. did Roadhouse. He did Die Hard. He did Predator. Uh, Commando. That's nice. good stuff. Very cool. Um, yeah. I think overall the story makes sense. Uh, and it works really well. I think that none of their performances are anything to write home about. Um. I think if it had been Gene Hackman and, you know, some other big names that were playing these characters, I might have been more invested in it. I don't know. The story wasn't super interesting to me. Yeah. It was very straightforward. There was no sort of surprises about it. 
Um, the only know. thing that surprised me was the initial shooting. And then after yeah, that, exactly. everything came exactly as you expected it to. Yeah, exactly. It was, and, and that was a little frustrating to me, actually, because I kept waiting for something to happen the that extra was more twist. interesting yeah. mm-hmm. and, it, and it never really came. And so I think I was a little disappointed in the movie because of that. But there was nothing innately wrong with it. But now that I think about it, considering all the cooperation they got from the border patrol there's no way that they could have said hotchkiss was a former agent this yeah. Or, yeah. or the uh mcmillan character they had to be kind to them. yeah they were they were just like no 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 everyone there has to be perfect there's we can't make anybody at the service look bad yeah yeah i don't know i think there was a more interesting movie to be had out of this yeah it, it was all right i don't think it i don't think it's a thumbs up yeah i think it's probably a thumbs down for me also it's a down from me. Um, I I have to be honest. I don't know many of Charlie Bronson's movies other than like The Great Escape, yeah, uh, and a couple a couple others. But and he spends that whole movie digging the tunnels. Yeah, he he is the the guy, who, the, the tunnel king. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, but uh, this seems very much in line with the kind of movies that he does. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, it's a. It's like you know, they killed. They killed my friend. I'm gonna find them, no matter what it takes. Yeah. You know, the only thing that that didn't happen in this is that he threw, turned in his gun and his badge. You know, like right. that, that's because what I was. He didn't have to because yeah. he's not even a part of the agency that would have those things. On. Yeah. Like I, I liked. I did like how they try to tell certain aspects of the both sides. Like, you know, the, they're being overwhelmed and there's there's too many of these these guys and and then Bruno Kirby gets like the line about. I have to send this guy back who's got nothing to go back to. You know, he he gave up everything to come here, and and so you they they try to they try to show you that there's like that they don't have any resentment yeah. towards these these people who are trying to come to America, um, but uh, at the same time, there's just it, it's it's a, I don't want to say it's bleak. It, it, it's a movie, it definitely is bleak. It, it, it's a movie without an ending because ultimately. What the we story, solved one murder. <laughs> yeah, we solved a murder, but the larger issue yeah. is still in play and, yeah. and nothing has changed. Well, it, the only thing it really did for me was show me just how crappy this job is. Like, yeah. you would not want this job because every, every time they came across a group, like these guys, they're not in super great shape, it seems. And no, they're just I like, mean, these are the guys that, that couldn't be cops. That's, yeah. that's the next step. But, that, that, but we basically see them chasing a group, huffing and puffing, trying to chase groups of people who are just scattering around fields and, yeah. and, and you know, in the desert. And it just, it, nothing about this job seems appealing at all. I yeah. don't know why anybody would want to do that. And not enough people did want to do it at the time, obviously, because... They were short on people. Yeah, the, the, on, well, on a federal probably, level, they weren't they, being funded. They also probably don't yeah, give them any money to, to fund this stuff. Yeah. And they, they're expected to do more and more and more with less. Letterboxed, what are you thinking? Um, it's, it's a middle-of-the-road movie, so it's in the middle of my letterbox. Uh, it is at 87. It is below Smokey and the Bandit 2 and above Holy Moses. Okay. Uh, I have it at uh, 91. Uh, just below Stardust Memories and just above Phobia. I have it in 79th. Uh, it's just below One Trick Pony and just above Bronco Billy. So we're all, you know. Yeah, middle of the road. Yeah. It's right on the borderline <laughs> of something I would want to watch ever again. Uh, I think that's everything for this one. If you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd, where, as I said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. Please consider rating us on iTunes to help people find the show. And if you take the time to leave us a review, we will thank you personally in an upcoming episode. If you're feeling especially generous, you can also support the show through Patreon.com slash Vintage Video Podcast. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Touched by Love, which IMDb describes like so. A young nurse becomes determined to reach an unresponsive teenage cerebral palsy patient by encouraging her to write to her favorite rock singer, Elvis Presley. We leave you now with the trailer for Touched by Love. Yes? It's 
Selena. Come on in. It's beautiful. Sit down. Why don't you paint during the day when there's light? There's no time. Lena, the, uh, the other children are starting to complain. About me? About you and Karen. Jason thinks it's his fault that you don't love him anymore. Oh, it's not. <laughs> Monica says you promised to help her with a book report. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot. You're creating a lot of resentment. It won't happen again. That's right, it won't. What I'm about to say is not a spur-of-the-moment decision. I've thought about it, wrestled with it, and tossed over it more nights than you'd believe. The long and the short of it is simply this. I'm going to make arrangements to have Karen transferred to a hospital. What? I, I don't understand. Why? To make room for some child who might make it all the way with our help. It's as simple as that. Well, that's not fair. You haven't even given her a chance. She's not on trial, Lena. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it that way. Of course you did. Because you believe in miracles, or hope for them. Well, I don't. I can't. Not in Karen's case. This may sound harsh, but at best her time is limited. You can't be sure. I can make a very educated guess. Unfortunately, we are not omnipotent. We can't stave off the inevitable. So we just write her off? It's late, and we're both rather tired. Sorry. It's just that... It's just so damn unfair. Can you tell me how soon? A few days. A week. <laughs> 